Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of Theology Matters with the Palouse. I am your host, Devin Palou, and we are coming to you on a Friday night, which is normally not the time we do our show. We normally do Wednesdays around midday. Uh, but tonight, I've got a special show we're going to be doing. Um, if you guys recall, probably two months ago, maybe three months ago, uh, I brought my friend Chris Allison on, who is an atheist, and we discussed um, yeah, some of the reasons he's an atheist, and I uh, got to get into a little bit of uh, some of the arguments for God's existence and had some good feedback on the show, so we wanted to bring him back. Uh, people seem to really like the the shows where we do the dialogue and discussion, and so uh, we like doing them as well. Uh, and so today we'll be having him back on, uh, look a little bit more at some of the arguments for God's existence as well as uh, the resurrection. We, we've been wanting to do this show for a while. I uh, wanted to do it around Easter time, but uh, we've, I've just had a bunch of stuff come up, and he's had a couple things come up, and so... Uh, it's coming to you a little bit past Easter, but uh, nonetheless, we're excited uh, to have this show. And we, we, you know, desire to kind of model how to have these important dialogues, um, you know, without uh, screaming and hollering and anger, et cetera. Uh, and so before I, I go too far with that and bring Chris in, let me just get a few quick things out of the way. Uh, if you go to our Facebook page, Theology Matters, with the Palouse, you guys can see our our uh, archive of shows that we have done, and you get a, important updates on shows and or events and that that we're doing. Um, currently at Rock Hill Bible Fellowship Thursday nights, we're leading an apologetics uh, curriculum by Awanas uh, called Ambassadors, and it's between for, for students between the ages of 13 and 18. And we're just looking at a lot of different worldview issues. A lot of students are hit with issues from uh, the LGBT community and uh, pro-life, pro-choice, is the Bible true? And a lot of them just don't know really how to have, uh, you know, answers to these kind of questions. And so uh, the curriculum from Sean McDowell is the one that was kind of behind this, really goes through a whole worldview curriculum. And so if you're in the Rock Hill area, uh, again, would love to have you Thursday nights, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. Next Wednesday, during our normal scheduled time, we are going to have Dr. Dave Geisler on. Dr. Dave Geisler uh, is the president of NGIM Ministries, Norm Geisler Ministries. And uh, for folks who may not have heard, uh, our beloved friend and mentor and professor, Dr. Norman Geisler had passed away last week and actually had his funeral last Saturday. So it's been kind of a – it's been a sad time. You know, it's a sad time to, to lose a guy that has meant so much and has impacted so much. Uh, Ravi Zacharias actually preached the funeral. He had just landed in Hong Kong when he got the call that Dr. Geisler had uh, fallen and, and they weren't expecting him to live long. And so uh, – Dr. Geisler wanted Ravi to preach the, the, the funeral, and so Ravi did. And he came in with about five minutes to spare, but gave a beautiful tribute to his professor and his mentor, Dr. Geisler. In fact, if you go to uh, the YouTube page, you can just type in Ravi Zacharias Norm Geisler, and you will see uh, Ravi's tribute to Dr. Geisler. So that said, we will have his son, Dave, on. And they have been working on this amazing documentary for the last couple of years of Dr. Geisler's life. And so we're going to have Dave on to talk about this. This is going to be a great time. Uh, also, Melissa, she's actually been at the Youth Apologetics Conference. Every summer, Charlotte Christian does a week-long apologetics conference for students. Uh, probably, again, between the ages of probably 13 to 18, and just phenomenal, folks. I mean, it's limited room, it's limited seats, it's, you know, it's, ah, they, you know, they pack out every single summer, uh, and they bring in some of the best guests, 
Greg Turek, Brian Davies, uh, Davies, I'm sorry, uh, Dave, Dave uh, Glander, just some top, top guys, Michael Brown. Um, so she's been there all week. She's been leading some small groups with the, with the girls. And so she's going to talk a little bit about that. So that will be uh, a fun show. So make sure you join us again. Uh, we'll be going 12 Eastern next Wednesday. And lastly here, the panel on abortion. Several people have asked about that. So there was a uh, amazing church called Zion Place Ministries in Greensboro. Uh, it is a predominantly African-American church, and they did a conference on uh, basically why pro-life. Um, they had some post-abortive women there and some other women who had been told by the doctor they should have an abortion, and they didn't, by God's grace. Um, You know, the the child is okay and uh, just thankful that she didn't have an abortion. Uh, Me and Melissa were on their panel to help answer maybe some of the objections or hard cases that come up. Uh, If you guys know us, you know we have a heart for life and uh, really are involved in the uh, abortion ministry. And so uh, if you want to see that, that was actually videoed. Uh, If you go on the Facebook page of Zion Place Ministries, you can actually watch the uh, first talk that uh, – I forget his, I forget the, the guy's name, but he's a pastor at the church. And then the second session is a panel discussion, and it's very powerful, very powerful to hear these women. Some of these women had an abortion 30 or 40 years ago, still devastated by those effects. But through God's grace, have come through it, and – I actually plan on interviewing several of them on some upcoming podcasts. So we've got a lot of good stuff coming up for you guys. So stay with us. Again, go to the Facebook page of Theology Matters with the Palouz and follow everything that we're doing there. We're going to take a quick uh, one-minute break, and then we will come back and bring on our guests. As we know, the culture is changing all around us and we're dealing with questions and issues and many times Christians find themselves unable or ill-equipped to answer questions. And a number of years ago, Ravi came up with a kind of a matrix, if you like, for looking at big questions, origins, meaning, morality, and destiny, that every religion, every ideology in the world has to answer. So what this curriculum has been designed to do is to take each one of those questions, look at the question, and also look at how we would answer it. How do discussions flow in conversations? How do people actually engage these questions, and how do we use them to bring the gospel intelligently into a conversation and think Christianly about life and respond to the questions? So Everyday Questions has been designed using some of our team to help answer those questions, engage with these issues, and give a tool that I think would be practical to help equip people on how to share the gospel. So I hope you'll give it some serious thought, and I guarantee it will be of great help. With so many Christian resources on the web today, it's hard to know who to trust or even where to start. So we handpick the best content. Biblical teaching, scripture reading, music, audiobooks, and more. Then we stream it directly to you. No searching, no downloading. Just press play. It's called RefNet, 24-hour Christian Internet Radio. Available now in the App Store and online. All right, folks, welcome back. And we are here, and we're going to have a discussion with my good friend Chris on uh, the arguments for God's existence as well as dive into the resurrection. Um, This may go two weeks. This may may go another episode. And so um, we're just going to kind of go through this. And I think our desire is just to have a good model of how you have these discussions uh, with people that disagree. Chris, are you there? Yes, sir. I'm here. Man, it's good to hear your voice again. <laughs> yes, it's, it's good, good to have you doing this again. Thank you. What I you know, what I appreciate appreciate about you is, um, you know, I think we both have the same desire. You know, we want to see uh, these kind of conversations happen uh, in a way mm-hmm. where, um, you know, people are not being insulted or put down or name calling. 
And a lot of times right. these kind of conversations end up with more more heat than light, you know. Um, actually, right. uh-huh. I've, I've only met, met – only met Chris one time uh, with, at a conference, but actually met mm-hmm. him over a, over a friend's Facebook page, and um, seeing him, um, you know, people coming at him a little bit and getting some questions with him, and so I, you know, I uh, started the conversation with him, and we've uh, gone back and forth a few times, but uh, again, I appreciate the respectful nature of it, so. Um, we wanted to wanted to have this discussion. So, Chris, just for people again who maybe don't know you, uh, just briefly kind of reintroduce yourself uh, again, folks. If you go to our podcast archives. Just type in Chris Allison. You guys can hear the first show that we did, um, and also we're on True Radio. If you go to uh, iTunes or on your Android, and again, uh, just type in Theology Matters with the Palouse, um, Chris Allison, or Atheist, and uh, that first show that we did should come up. So, Chris, tell us a little bit quickly about who you are and, uh, you know, whether you had a religious upbringing, uh, et cetera. Oh, okay. Well, you know, my name's Chris, and uh, like, I, like you said a moment ago, I, I met you on Facebook, and uh, it was through a different, you know, person, uh, someone who is not quite as mature as you, I might add, <laughs> who, who engages, who loves to engage in this sort of uh, – uh, back and forth with one another, and keep, and you know, keep it largely civil, of course, because we're both interested in the truth. I think we're trying to figure right. out what's going on as best we can, and knowing that in the end, you know, whether we live another year or whether we live another hundred years, we're probably still never going to know enough, you know, to make sense of this world. But we're trying our best, you know. We're all doing that, and we, and like you said, it's best to. Keep it civil, so that you know you can learn better. You, you, you learn more. You know, like you said, you don't you don't want to get into a insulting match with one another. That's very unproductive. Right. Anyway, for most of my yeah, life, I've never I've been indifferent indifferent to religion. You know, most of my life, I've just been indifferent to it. It, it was never a big okay. thing when I grew when I grew up. It was never really a big thing at all. But I've always been um, obsessed with history, and of course. Religion is part of history. All religions are. Uh, it, it's hard to you know, separate it from from anything. You know, it's always it's, it's in the cultures, in the politics, it's in everything. Anyway, um, right. at some point, you know, at, at least twenty years ago, it, it has to have been at least twenty years ago. I decided, that, you know, I need to read the Bible because I've never read it. I mean, I, I, for me, it was certain parts of it, a little bit, not much at all. But I'm like, hey, I need to read that thing. Well, I mean, I didn't get very far before I realized that, you know, <laughs> well, no, 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 this isn't for me. But, you know, I finished it up, and I guess you can say at that point, well, I, I mean, if if there was any belief at all, it was gone if, at that point after reading the book. I was like, yeah, there, there's there's nothing in here to convince me that there's a God or God. Right, and just just so people know, um, you know what, Chris isn't going to take anything I say offensive because we're not attacking the person, we're attacking the ideas, right. and I'm not going to take anything he says. So um, I want him to freely, you know, he doesn't believe the Bible is true, and so um, I'm fine with him saying that, and fine, with, you know, if he his ideas that the Bible is fairy tales and mythical, etc. I don't take offense to that. He doesn't believe it's true. Uh, and so just, you know, don't be surprised if we, you know, we may uh, be a little blunt with each other, but we respect each other. And, and I think it's that's a good way to be able to get down to uh, to truth with that. So just so people know, um, I don't take him being rude and, and I don't think you're going to take what I'm, you know, as being rude either. So. All right. So you had said you kind of, you know, you you read the Bible, and then from there, kind of, if there was any belief, um, it was kind of squelched at that point that there that there wasn't uh, any God. So, would you consider yourself, or would you call yourself, an atheist, an agnostic, um, or maybe, you know, where where would you, where did you, where were you back then, and then where would you say you are now? Well. Uh, back then, I was just indifferent. Didn't I wasn't interested so much. That wasn't okay. too concerned. 
about, you know, going to church and doing things like that. Uh, but as far as de- definitions are concerned, I mean, I consider myself atheist, and that just simply re- means that, at least in regards to religion, I have yet to be pr- to be convinced by anyone, regardless of whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, that there are gods out there, you know, some something mm-hmm. otherworldly, and right. that's why I did. Uh, I say there, uh, there's no God because no one has prevented any, pre- presented any e- evidence to me that convinced me there are so. That doesn't mean that one day somebody might come up to me and say something, and voila, uh, you're right. There you're is right. a God, or there is a whole pantheon of gods perhaps. I don't know. That's always possible. Sure. So you say right now, I think your statement was that in your – in your view, there there is no God because you've not seen the evidence that would support that. Is that right? Yes, mm-hmm. I agree. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I would just say, um, try to. I've got a little notebook here. I'm trying to take some notes on, but my little girl has drawn pictures on every single page. So I, can, I can hear my little boy downstairs screaming his head off. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'll he's down there playing video games. Yeah, he's just down okay, there playing video games. Does too. Mm-hmm. She gets on that road That's bike and mm-hmm. it's all up. <laughs> okay, so I guess this this is where I would press a little bit. You'd say that um, because you haven't seen evidence for the existence of God, you would say that there is no God. But I think it would be just tantamount to saying because we haven't, we don't have any evidence for aliens. Would you say, therefore, aliens do not exist or extraterrestrials? Uh, I don't see any evidence of them, so I would say they don't exist based on what's been presented to me. I mean I've, I've seen some things on TV about aliens. I, I don't watch a lot of that stuff, but I mean it doesn't seem no, to happen. It. it doesn't seem to be – it it could be. I mean the universe well, is I vast. Guess I just, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it, to me, it seems like that's a it's a big leap to say because there it, I haven't seen evidence for X, therefore X does not exist. So it just seems, you know, but with the with the definition of atheism, it would just seem to be a safer bet to go more of an agnostic route. Because when you start saying, well, you know, God does not exist because I don't see evidence for it uh, for him. Well, you could say the same thing just as there's not evidence for aliens. I don't think it would logically warrant uh, the jump to say, therefore, aliens do not exist. It would just be, well, I don't have evidence for it. Maybe someday down the road there will be evidence for it. Uh, But as of right Mm -hmm. now, I'm not convinced. That's a safer statement, it seems to me, than to say uh, aliens do not exist. Well, my personality, I'm just not afraid of labels. I'm I'm also I'm not afraid of language either. A lot of people, you know, they have issues with labels and they have issues with language. I don't care. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter. If you want to listen to me and think, well, he sounds more like an agnostic. That's fine. But since yeah, be perfectly honest with you. Since be perfectly honest with you, I'm sort of like uh, a little bit of a nonconformist and. In most of the social situations I've ever been a part of, you know, if someone comes up and it, they talk about them as being an atheist, then it's like, you know, you know, they're an outsider or something, and you know, maybe we need to shun them or something like that. You know, they're just radically mm-hmm. different, and I'm I'm a, attracted to that, to be honest with you. Okay. I, I don't want so, to be okay. a so it's more for shock value than more than than necessarily. Oh, I- <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, yeah, that's, I like that that's fair. I just I I just ask because like I say again, it seems like um the atheist position is harder. It would be a very much seems to me to be a harder position to maintain than than agnosticism. So to say, well I'm an I'm an atheist and God does not exist seems like you couldn't there's no way you could you could really demonstrate that. Even if you haven't seen well, evidence for the existence of God yet, it wouldn't conclude that therefore God doesn't exist. Just like because well, we haven't seen I mean, evidence for aliens yet doesn't mean therefore aliens don't exist. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I try to make it clear to people exactly what I think atheism is, the way I, I define it. And, and again, that's just that, okay, there's all this evidence that, you know, there are these Hindu gods, and, you know, I've looked at it and I'm thinking, no, I'm not, that doesn't convince me. Sorry. That doesn't mean they're not real. That doesn't mean that they couldn't be, but if this okay. is all you got, yeah. I don't believe it. The same thing with any other religion, whether it's Islam, Sikhs, whatever. Okay. You know, I'm like, yeah. Give me some evidence and let me weigh it. Let me measure it. Let me think. I, let me think about it. I'll let you know. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't convince me, I'm going to let you know. So that doesn't yeah, again. That okay. doesn't preclude that's, that's fair be any god. It just you need right. a little bit more evidence. So you're okay. You're open to it, but okay. Um, yeah. What, and you uh, get into these. Are, are, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying when you get into these stories and how they develop uh, about you right. know, these gods, it's like you know. Then you begin to realize you've got to come up with a lot better evidence than that. Because you know, one, you know, one of the things we're talking, we're going to talk about tonight is the resurrection. I'm like, okay, right. you know, that's that's an extraordinary thing. So mm-hmm. that means you need to have some extraordinary evidence. Nothing mundane about that. Okay, so what do you mean by extraordinary evidence? I hear this a lot from atheists, but I'm not really sure I know what it means. Um, evidence is just evidence, isn't it? It has to be very compelling. I mean, there can, there shouldn't be any wishy washiness about it whatsoever. You know, well, what, I mean, if you're telling me that someone mean? died and then they 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 came back from death and they're well again. They're healthy or whatever. You know, you better show me how did that happen. Explain it to well, what? Yeah. What? Let me ask you. What is the difference between evidence and extraordinary evidence? Because it seems like so you're saying someone could present evidence, but because it doesn't meet your criteria of what you would think extraordinary evidence is, then you would dismiss it. So what do you mean by extraordinary evidence? Again, it, it, it should just be crystal clear. I mean, leave without any doubt whatsoever. I mean, you know, you could be on a jury and you know, you're weighing the evidence and it looks like, you know, the guy's guilty. But, you know, uh-huh. you got to make that decision. You've got to go get in there to, so you're saying, with you're your, saying, your, your other peers in, that, in that jury room. Go ahead. So you're saying extraordinary evidence is that which is beyond doubt? It should it should eliminate as much doubt as possible because I mean I want to believe as much th- uh, things that are true and uh, as I possibly can. You know what I'm saying when it comes to evidence. But why, why I mean, not just say reasonable doubt beyond reasonable doubt? Why it seems like you're putting an extra burden of proof or evidence. Um, well, you need that. I mean, it has like, to be reasonable. Yeah, it has to. Well, yeah, it has to be reasonable. Well, yeah. For, for 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 example, um, there are okay. You don't deny, I would assume, you don't deny people have landed on the moon, right? No, not at all. I mean, we've been to the moon. I, I believe okay. that. That's not a hope. You, and, the Earth is flat. It's round. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So there are people that would deny that, right? So just because yeah. um, you have good, strong evidence for it, you can still have people that deny it. So when you say crystal clear or extraordinary evidence, um, I mean, you're not going to get evidence where everybody agrees to it. It's just even evidence like, again, the, 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 the earth isn't flat, the Holocaust happened, man landed on the moon. Even that I'm here right now, right, that, that there are things mm-hmm. outside of my mind. There are people that doubt that. So I, I guess before we move on, I think we just need to define what it is exactly you mean. Maybe you want to take that back and just say evidence, but if you're going to say extraordinary evidence, I need to know what that means because it seems like you're setting the bar so high, nothing is going to be able to convince you. If it's reasonable, I'm with. I'm, I, I can understand it. You know, I can go with that. Okay. I mean. Okay. You so understand? You would just say sometimes. 
I mean, you know, we what I'm trying to say, I guess, is, you, you know, you go back to a courtroom situation. You know, people are always on trial for murder, and you know, you've got to right. you've got to take that responsibility very seriously as a juror to weigh what's been presented to you because you don't want to lay let somebody off who committed a crime, but at the same time, you also don't want to see someone punished for a crime they didn't do. You've got sure, to have sure. no, I'm, much I'm, evidence I'm with you, possible. And I, I'm with you, and so you know, um, maybe for those who, who this may be your first time here on our show, uh, me and my wife, we are missionaries with a group called Ratio Christi, which is Latin for the reason for Christ. And our mm-hmm. our job is on the college campus giving evidence giving reasons, giving arguments for the Christian faith. And so there are many Christians, and this is unfortunate, who would say that um, there is no evidence. or that. And I, I think even that's an overstatement. I don't think most Christians would say that. Um, they would just say that uh, faith is blind. And um, I would say that that's not true. In fact, our motto is no blind faith. So I say that to say I'm with you that there needs to be evidence for the for mm-hmm. um, a particular worldview or position to be held, I guess I'm just wanting to make sure that because what I see oftentimes and and again you know we're talking blunt with each other and that's okay but what I see from the Christian uh, from the atheist community sometimes is they have a standard of evidence this you know this subjective extraordinary evidence uh, that is so high nothing can convince them and I think it just needs to be evidence there's no there's no I don't see, and maybe you, you, if you want to stick to the extraordinary evidence, I would just ask you to explain to me what is the difference between evidence and extraordinary evidence. It seems to me that evidence is evidence. Well, two things I want to say to that, what you just said there. Um, yep. It is very easy for our minds to to fool ourselves. It really is. I mean – yeah. You mentioned a moment ago I agree. people who, who don't believe in the moon landing. I mean I don't know what their right. motivation is for not believing that, but a lot of people simply refuse to believe it, and I, I, and I don't know why. The, nothing short of right. you know, NASA putting them on a rocket and taking them to the moon. <laughs> I don't know why. Right. They have to go that far, but I think that's the way they are, and, and the people who deny right. the Holocaust. Now, I, I have a feeling I know why they deny the Holocaust because you know they're anti-Semitic. Uh, but right. we have to be very right. careful because it is very easy for us, you know, I guess, on a subconscious level, to choose something without re- having thought it through, without weighing the evidence, and right. just becoming partial yeah. to that kind of thinking. And, I agree, and not having an, I, I and not agree. having an I open agree. mind. Man, we look. We work with students all the time, and I was with mm-hmm. some last night. You know, and I'm asking them. These yeah. are, some of these have grown up in the church their whole life. Why do you believe God exists? They have no idea. They have no no clue as to why they think God exists or why the Bible is true. And so I'm with you. We shouldn't adopt things. Simply because uh, it's what we were taught growing up, or because it makes us comfortable, etc. So, you know, I'm I'm with you on there. Um, but mm-hmm. back okay. to this, would you would you kind of maybe recant this claim of extraordinary evidence and just agree that we need to look at the evidence? Yes, that's fine. Because if you say yeah. extraordinary evidence, okay, okay, that's good. That's good enough with that. Okay. All right, so I mean, you, you, you still got to you still got a mountain climb, you know, to convince me that the resurrection occurred, though. <laughs> well, you know, look, you were kind of hitting on it. There is a difference between proof and persuasion. You can prove something beyond reasonable doubt, but just like you can prove, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, we landed on the moon. Not everybody's going to be persuaded, you know, and so uh, might be able to <laughs> prove it, but may not persuade you. So. Let me ask you this, kind of as we're, we're, we're moving along here. Um, you said you, you read the Bible. You just simply were not convinced that uh, God exists. Um, how how would – let, let's say even that the – say even the Bible was not true. How would that show that God doesn't exist? Like how do you how, – it just seems like a wild jump to go from the Bible's not true, therefore atheism. Like how do you get to that conclusion? 
Well, I guess if deism, you want to know about other Christians, or pantheisms. Well, again, right, if you want so to know about the Christian, Christian gods. Say, yeah. Sorry. So say, I mean, say you, you read the Bible, about, okay? You you read the yeah. Bible, you come to the conclusion that the Bible is not true, and you're saying at that point you gave up your belief that there was any God that existed. I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of different views of God, so how do you get from the Bible isn't true to therefore atheism is true? seems like a wild jump. Um, I'd say for me, again, I mean if you want to know about a particular – God, you have to go to the sources that are available for it. Now, right, but maybe, I don't, maybe deism just, is true, right? Say, say the Bible's false. Maybe deism is true, or another kind of monotheism is true. But how do you get well, from that, well the Bible is well, true, therefore atheism? Okay. Well, I mean, if deism is true, then so be it. I mean, what's big deal? I mean, to, to my understanding of deism, you know, God. Or the, a god, or the gods, or whatever, basically created the universe, and then they just went on their merry way, and they haven't looked back since about what they did. I mean, what difference does it make whether yeah, you believe in them or not? I'm just saying to, to identify as an atheist when it just seems like the evidence wouldn't warrant that. It would just say, okay, well, um, you know, Christianity isn't true, but that, to me, that just doesn't necessarily mean therefore atheism because you still have a lot of things that need to be accounted for. So just as an example, when I'm talking to a student who is an atheist, right, I don't start with the yep. Bible. I don't start with, well, Genesis 1-1 says in the beginning. No, I start right. with philosophical arguments for the origin of the universe, um, for um, the, uh, being, the universe being sustained by an outside causal agent, design of the universe, etc. It's not till pretty far later am I getting into the Bible. And so I, I guess I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of other steps that you seem to just overlook and go right to atheism uh, that doesn't seem really warranted. That's just my, you know, just my well, opinion. Well, if that's the that. case, I mean, what it doesn't seem to me to make much difference whether, I mean, if there is a god or gods, I'd seriously doubt they're really concerned about my individual life, much less the entire. Race of humanity. I seriously doubt they're concerned about it whatsoever. Well, you, you, and if you look you back to human though, history, you would see that apparently they don't. <laughs> well, you you should care though because you care about truth and you want to believe true things. So if well, it's true I'm that right. God exists, right, right. So if it's true that God exists, it is a big deal if you have a wrong view of that. I guess that's all I'm saying. It just seemed like well, a that wild would be true to me. To I don't know if it would be true to the God. I don't think it would care one way or another whether what I think of it, regardless. But again, going back to the Bible, I mean, if you want to understand what's considered to be the Christian gods, you would have to go to that oh, source, yeah. the Bible, and I, study it. I agree. It. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not disputing that at all. I agree with that. All I'm saying is that to go from, well, the Bible isn't true to therefore atheism is true isn't justified because there's all kind of other theisms that are there is what I'm saying. But that, that's – I think, yeah, that's fine. Um, I can't say that I've, I've studied all the other theisms out there, but I'm just – they don't right. appeal to me. That doesn't mean they're not true or not. I don't know about – Hinduism that much, but I mean it could be real, but I don't think so, and I'm not really interested in it. Okay. Not right, yet, no, anyway. I hear you. Yeah. Okay, so you say that you know you've studied the issues, you've you've looked into the Bible, you've looked into Christianity, you've just not seen any evidence. Um, so have you actually looked at um, arguments for the existence of God? Yes. What what would some of those arguments be that you've looked at? Well, I can't think of any that convinced me, that's for sure. I mean – Can you think of um, any that didn't convince you? I guess I'm trying mm -hmm. to see if – have you actually looked at arguments from Christian philosophers, or are you just – you've read the Bible and that didn't convince you? Well, I mean that was a pretty so what are some of the significant thing right there. I mean reading the Bible – for the first time, and 
you know, again, I didn't come up, I didn't, wasn't brought up in a religious tradition at all in my family, but, you know, virtually everyone in my family went to church. Virtually uh-huh. everybody I ever knew as a friend also had some, you know, um, church experience to some extent, and there was, you know, uh, people I went to school with and such who, you know, they knew more about it than me, but, I mean, they may have been just as ignorant as the st- student you were talking to the other day who, you know, who, you know, they, they couldn't really defend it, didn't know that much about it, even though they had a much more extensive background in going to church than I did and, and considered sure. themselves a believer. But you know, so you kind my, of just grew up in a, in a church culture. Oh, yeah, because I mean, well, we're in the south, right? So it's kind yeah, of, yeah, exactly. South, we're in the south. Just, the people, yeah, there, yeah, there's there's the one church around, around the corner, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it just seems like you know, um, you know, it doesn't sound like you yourself though, have actually looked into the arguments. For the existence of God, you've maybe read the Bible, but the Bible doesn't isn't really the Bible's kind of written with the assumption that God exists. It's not a it's you know the Bible is true, and the Bible I would say is the Word of God, uh, but the Bible isn't, for example, a textbook on science or medicine or logic or those things. It seems like you know you'd need to look at what does some of the philosophers say um, in well, regards to that. So, I mean, have, you, have you read? Uh-huh. Uh, throughout my life, Christians who were interested in, you know, whether or not I was a believer or not, have said, "You need to read this book." Now, for most right. of my life, I I would just smile politely and say, "Yeah, you're probably right," you know. And then, but eventually, at one point, you know, I got around to doing it. No, I have not, you know, like your your friend who passed away the other day. I've never read any of his books. I think I may have seen him once or twice on YouTube or something like that. And I've I have watched debates, you know, with Christopher Hitchens and other people online with, with uh-huh. people like Frank Burick and uh oh sh- McDowell fellow. What was his name? I can't remember. Uh anyway, Alex John, McFarland. John, John, uh, Alex yeah. McFarland. I've seen him debate. You know, those are interesting. That that's that would be my exposure to, I guess, you know, a Christian apologist or a philosopher. So seeing you yourself those debates, not actually, reading about those debates. Okay, so you yourself have not actually read any like philosophy of religion textbooks. And, no, and I think doesn't that, sound like. What's that fellow's name? Is it Tim Keller? Does that does that sound familiar? Uh, no. Right. Yeah. He's, one a, of, he's a pastor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I, I read one of his books a long time ago. Okay. Okay. Um, and so um, you say you, you're not really convinced um, from what you've seen from Christianity. So do you know – are you familiar with any of the arguments for God's existence? Like what ones have you looked at and have just not convinced you? I haven't – I mean, none of them seem to convince me. I mean, again, um, well, na- name name one or two that um, maybe that you've looked at, and we can look at some of the problems that you see with them. Off the head, I can't really think of anything. I mean, I, I just going back to uh, what we were originally uh, going to talk about was the resurrection. I mean, just thinking about that lately, and you know, just thinking of how. You know, it right. just doesn't comprehend. I, it's hard to imagine a okay. lot of that being accurate. Okay, so yeah, we can go with that. We can we can look at the resurrection. The reason I bring up these points is because if God does not exist, then the resurrection mm-hmm. isn't going to happen, right? So the reason I think it's important when we look at arguments for the existence of God is um, if you if we start with the presupposition that God doesn't exist, anything I give you, any arguments, any reasons I give you for the resurrection is going to be ridiculous. It's going to be silly because if God doesn't Mm -hmm. exist, then any kind of account, any naturalistic account is more reasonable than God raising Jesus from the dead because you haven't looked at and are not familiar with arguments for the existence of God. 
And what I've seen does not convince me. I mean, I've, again, I've read the right. Bible well, and I'm I not convinced. And, I, and I've seen these, I have right. seen arguments from yeah, teleological yeah. arguments. These, these things don't convince me. And okay, so what is it about? I, it, gets, it, gets even more, it gets more specific. It gets more specific, though, when you look at the literature itself, though. When you, you know, when I first read the book and I was like, wow, this was, you know, this was a hard to get through. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, it was not easy reading yeah. the book, the Bible, that's for sure. So and what then, is it? What 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 was it specifically with like the teleological argument? What was it about that that didn't convince you? I, at, the, at this moment, I can't really think of anything because I've been thinking about the resurrection for the last week or so. To be honest with you. Okay. Okay. Like I say, the reason that I bring that those issues up of God's existence, would you agree that if God exists, that miracles are possible? Would you agree with that? Not not if, not the, if a God exists, Jesus is existed. miracles possible? Are miracles if possible? If a God exists, yep. if a God is, uh, exists, miracles are possible. I would imagine if um, <laughs> if a God were interested, uh, yeah, he could probably do something that would look m- miraculous. Uh, again, you would have to assume well, he that he would be example, interested if God creates. If God creates the universe from nothing, I would say that's that's a pretty big miracle. Just for the sake of argument, would you agree that if God do, did create, if the if there is evidence that God creates the universe, then that would be a miracle? Would you agree with that? If God I guess creates so. the universe from nothing, yeah, that yeah, would be I'll a go miracle, with you for, right? argument, for argument's sake. I'll go with you for argument's sake. Yes. Okay. Okay, and so that's why that's where that's kind of where I'm going with this is if we skip over that question of does God exist, then going to the resurrection doesn't make a lot of sense. And that's why I've kind of brought on that issue of does God exist? Because if God exists, then miracles are possible. And you can't just um, a priori kind of slam the door on the resurrection because. What happens is with the, a lot of times with the atheist is miracles can't happen because all there is, nature is all there is, matter is all there is, material is all there is. And so when you Christians start giving these reasons for the resurrection, any other account is more reasonable because God doesn't exist. But the whole Christian center of the resurrection in Christian theology is, is on the basis that God exists. And God miraculously raised Jesus from the dead. And so that's why I'm saying I think it's important not to just skip over that question of does God exist. And that's why I'm asking you those questions as far as are you familiar with any of the actual arguments for God's existence? And, um, you know, it sounds like you're saying you're not. At the moment, I mean, I'm not really – I haven't really – prepared to think about those, to be honest with you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'll tell you what. If you wanted to talk about the resurrection, I guess we can we can do that. Um, so let's let's go ahead. Let's jump into it. So what are what what is the reason you would say that you you do not find the uh resurrection convincing? Well why don't we start this way? Why don't you okay. tell me why it should be convincing to me? I mean, what is it about the resurrection that interests you and why it should be of concern to me? That, you well, want to do that? I mean, um, we can. That's fine. Um, well, because uh, if the Bible is true, um, which I think that there's good reasons to think that the Bible is reliable and accurate, um, then and Jesus raised from the dead, then that changes – um, the way we view the world. You you know what a world view is, I assume. Yeah, right? how you see the world, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and those questions as far as, you know, what is reality? Uh, is nature all there is? Is there a God, et cetera? So that kind of – that that question is going to determine, um, you know, whether or not, you know, these, these kind of questions are important. So I, I think they are important. Um, because again, our whole worldview is is 
centered on that. And so the resurrection really is the key pinnacle. Um, if it doesn't happen, then Christianity is false. And so I would say, again, I'm just going to ask you, um, what is it What is it that you, you say you've read the Gospels, you've read the resurrection, you find it kind of ridiculous? What is it that you, you find ridiculous or not convincing um, about the accounts in the resurrection? I'm not quite sure. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it tells a tale of something really incredible that happened, that someone died, and then they came back to life. And that doesn't okay. really normally happen in this world. I mean, yes, people are thought to be dead sometimes, and you know they're able to resuscitate them moments later, but not three days. You don't get right. to die one day and come back three days. And I forgot sure. I was trying to make this point earlier, and I don't, I forgot now why I was trying to make this point. But I mean, as you know, as I'm reading. The Bible, and I think at the at the end, you know, it. I remember, you know, so much of this just being fantastic tales. I mean, it's like the stuff you'd read in in, in uh, Greece or Rome about their religions. These fantastic uh, stories about these gods, and it just I began to look into, you know, how did the Bible, be, how was it composed, and when you you do some research, and I haven't done any, nearly enough of this, but, I mean, you find stuff that you're never going to be told before it, 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 that no one seems to pay a whole lot of attention to. It, even if you are a devoted Christian, you don't hear about these things when you're in church. I mean, for some reason, no one bothered to tell me that, you know, the uh, the New Testament, uh, you know, it, it begins with uh, – Matthew, I believe, and ends with Revelation. Well, those stories, I think it may be, what, 26 of them or something like that, 27 different books. Mm -hmm. They, right? I'm not sure, I'm not sure why it, it, it was done this way, but they were put in that order for a reason, I suppose, or I, I'm not sure if it was just random, but they're not in chronological order. I thought that was interesting. Why aren't these put in chronological yeah. order? That would, that would make more sense. So you'd end up having, you know, many of the uh, works of Paul first before you get to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Sure. And but I just see, think that's, that's I don't think that's and then and then and then you know, I look into it some more and I discover that well the gospels, you know, these famous to me famous individuals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't write these books. You know, over a hundred years later, someone or longer, someone decided this book needs a title. Let's give it this title. We'll say it was written by Luke. No, it wasn't. And so I bring this up. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm just no, saying no, I bring this ahead, up. To, I just bring this up to some people, and you know, and they're. More religious than I am, they go to church and then they come across. They they hear me say things like this, and it's like I've never heard that before. Well, it, I never heard of it either. But guess what? You need to find. You should look into it. I think it's, well, you know, the you thing, know how the Bible yeah, is composed, <laughs> which books made it in the final cut, which books didn't, and reasons why. I think that's very interesting. I think it is too, and I think that needs to be, you know, we need to take the time to research that. As far as the oh, books yeah. being in chronological order, all anybody has to do is, is if you go to, for example, if you're in the Book of Corinthians, any Bible will tell you when the book when that book is written. They're not trying to hide anything. They're not trying to deceive anybody. It tells you in the Bible where the letters or when the letters were written. So there's nothing, you know, deceitful or anything like that going on there. Um, as far no. as uh, kind of some of the other issues you bring up, I would say for the case for the resurrection, it doesn't require – now, I do hold uh, to inerrancy and inspiration, but it doesn't require that somebody has to hold to those things in order to have a good case, I would say, for the resurrection. The, the issue is this, I think, Chris. This is where – this is kind of why I brought this up earlier. You, know, you started with saying, well, it's, it's these fantastic tales and stories. You have a presupposition against miracles, 
and you have a presupposition against miracles because you don't think God exists. And so I think that's kind of the core central kind of point of the discussion is does God exist? Because if he doesn't, then you're right. There's not going to be any explanation, supernatural explanation for the resurrection. But I think you need to give reasons when you're saying, well, the Bible is just fantastic stories uh, that someone dies and comes back to life. Well, what is your argument against miracles? Well, because that just assumes miracles. My experience, happen. miracles, what's your, what's miracles your are simply. My experience with miracles is simply that if something happens or maybe it doesn't happen and it's labeled a miracle, it's only because of a lack of understanding about what just happened. I mean, mm-hmm. we don't see miracles anymore. I mean, there's a, you know, there are miracles all through, written throughout the, the Bible. I mean, not just with the resurrection of certain people who were dead for a few days and they come back. I mean, you got a donkey that talks. You got a guy who lived in the well for a few days. I mean, it just goes on and on. You don't see this stuff happening anymore. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, but, and when you see yeah, mockery, uh, a miracle, mockery what you call is an argument, though, right? See what I'm saying? Mo- mo- mockery is not an argument. Saying that these things are silly, pointing things out in the Bible and saying it's silly, that's not an argument against miracles. You have to give reason. You have to give an actual argument as to why miracles have you ever happen. Have I you can, ever seen an animal talk? I mean, have I, you ever a lot seen of things you, I you, I've never but seen but life you come from non living material. I've never seen life come what? from non living material. I mean, I could point all you, kinds of things out in Darwinian evolution that I think are ridiculous that we never see. But again, that doesn't mean it did, that doesn't prove it didn't happen. I have to give arguments. Well, do you I think you're ever going to see someone get swallowed by a whale or a giant fish and live in it for three days? Do you think that's ever going to happen? I mean, if God you know, at one time that, that, that he was going to do that, yeah, because God exists, and I think there's good reasons to think God exists. I mean, you're saying but, that, I mean, that as though that couldn't happen. So I would say, what are what reasons do you have to say miracles can't happen? What's your argument for that? Well, how about the fact that you know you don't see too many miracles in, since the invention of the camera? I guess you know. I guess a long time ago, a lot of people thought a lot of things were happening that were miracles, even just because of you know it was easy to think that way because it's so 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 easy for our minds to play a trick on us to believe something mm-hmm. that we don't have any rational reason to believe. We just want to chalk it up to it was a miracle. That's what happened. I mean, if you do a little research, do a little give. If you let someone else maybe look into it. You might discover that you know it wasn't so miraculous after all. After all, what just happened? There, there is a uh, an explanation that can be discovered if, in time. I mean, at one time we didn't know what thunder was. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, our ancestors you know, probably huddled, you know, scared to death, didn't know what all that noise was about, and it would, then it would go away, and they would just scratch their heads. What was that? But you know, eventually <laughs> we figured it out. Today. Chris, there are claims today from people all over the world. Craig Keener has a, a two-volume uh, mass set of people who, who talk about certain miracles that happen physically, etc., uh, that's documented with doctors, etc. So I guess I would just say that, I mean, you still have miracle claims today. How do you know that miracles haven't happened today? How do you know that? Well, I mean, why can't we have, you know, a miracle like, you know uh, – the Earth stops it stops rotating on its axis so that you know um, we have more daylight so we can defeat our enemies. I mean, there's a story about that as well. I think Jericho, mm-hmm. it's the city of Jericho. You know, somebody was attacking the city, and you know they needed more daylight so they could tell their enemies from their you know their uh, fellow soldiers. You don't see something like that. You don't you, you don't see an animal that can speak. Yeah, I mean, but it seems like those that, things that you're pointing out, that's very small compared to the universe coming into existence from nothing. If God can create well, the universe from nothing, and there's arguments for that, and there's reasons to think that happened, I mean, I don't understand why we'd have to have the Earth stop. The the question was the bigger question is why is there an Earth, which naturalism and atheism can't give an account for that. 
So I guess it just I mean, seems I, like, I, you know, I, you know, you I guess my small reason. mind can only think about the, the the earth, you know. I can only think about where I'm at. I mean, you know, about the universe. I mean, we know collectively, all of humanity knows virtually nothing about the universe. I mean, we're, we're, we're on this one little tiny planet, this one little tiny section of the galaxy. Uh, and how can we know that much about the universe itself? I mean, I'm, I need to be well, focused here. Well, because we can know we – can... Right, and this gets right back to, again, where I was going with the arguments for God's existence. We can know certain philosophical principles. We know that whatever begins to exist has a cause. When the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. That's a, the Kalam cosmological argument for God's existence. So, you know, it's we not don't, something we don't know that has anything to do with Jesus, though. We don't know anything about well, that. Right. You have to give more arguments for that. You have to you have to have more arguments to get to Jesus. I agree, but um, it's not less than uh, the God of the Bible either. Yeah, you have to give a cumulative case, but either way, that's enough to defeat atheism. It's enough to defeat naturalism. Mm. Not for me. I mean, it should be. I mean, if, if there's reasons to think the universe came into existence from nothing. Um, with a with an outside causal agent, that demonstrates a naturalism is false. That nature is not all there is. That there is something supernatural, and that's why I say um, you have to be open to the miracles at that point. You can't just say, "Well, it's they're just silly," right? Um, if God exists and there's reasons to think that by the the philosophical arguments for God's existence, then you have to be open to things like the resurrection and the other miracle uh, accounts in the Bible. Well, I think I am open to it. It's just that, you know, I read about it, and you see the inconsistencies in the stories, and I just think I'm I'm going to dismiss this. This is right because I don't know if if, if someone meant it. I don't know if someone meant this to be uh, fiction or if they meant it to be true, but it's an interesting story, but it's not convincing to me. Whether we're talking about well, someone being swallowed by a whale or someone dying for three days and coming back to life. Yeah, but see, it just seems like if God exists, could he have a uh, great fish swallow a man if God heat. exists? And... Why do you keep calling it he? Well, that's how, that's, that's how the Bible refers to God. God is not male or female. God is an immaterial being. Um, so I'm just using the language that the Bible uses, but back to the question – if God decided to uh, – he was going to use a great fish to swallow a man, are you saying that he couldn't do that if God existed? Um, I'm thinking that you know, if you're a god, you, you must know everything, and you must have incredible powers. You must be able to do anything. So if – I don't know what your motivation would be, but if you wanted a great fish to swallow a man, yes, I think you could do that if you were a god. Okay. That would seem to be like so a pre- prerequisite. Right. So to just keep talking about it being silly, I think what you need to do is is demonstrate either God does yeah God doesn't exist or miracles can't happen. So I'm I guess I'm still waiting to hear your argument outside of it's silly or it's fiction. What arguments do you have to say miracles can't happen? Do you have some reasons that you, or argument you could give that show God does not exist? Well, well, for one thing, I mean it can't – or it won't join me for a cup of coffee. How about that? I mean I'm not asking for much. I mean I'm just a simple, mortal human being out of you know the beings that have lived since you know the beginning of life on this planet. And if all you got is that book you – know, don't expect me to fall for it. I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to believe that. It's not rational. But why would what, you? You know, if, if you right, want to come, you, if you want to, if it's important that I do believe whatever it is you want me to believe, a God should be able to do it without just as easily as it could have a great fish swallow a man for three days or whatever. Should be able to do what? Should make me believe, convince me of the evidence that it exists. And that I need to be concerned about what it thinks and why it 
it would need my worship. I don't even understand why do why do people think gods need to be worshipped to begin with? What's the point? Yeah, what is so the point I think in that? this this. Yeah, this goes back to that issue of not not uh, being familiar with any of the philosophy uh, of religion and the arguments for the existence of God. So when you're saying, for example, why doesn't he just show up and have a cup of coffee with me? Well, if you are familiar with the arguments for God's existence that philosophers give, you'll see uh, it's a lot more that he's given than just sitting and having a cup of coffee with you. Uh, he's giving you life. He sustains you. Uh, the universe itself <laughs> cannot be explained apart from uh, apart apart from this necessary being. So I, how I don't really think it's that much. I don't think it's that much to ask that if a god well, wants does, me to believe in its existence, why can't it just do something simple, very simple, like just join me for a cup of coffee? I'm not asking it to move mountains. I'm not asking it to turn back time or anything. Ex- really extraordinary i will buy the coffee i will take it out to any place for a meal if it wants anywhere i will go in debt <laughs> for this you, re- you realize god is you realize god is not a physical being right it can be it was not at one time be. jesus takes on a human nature but he himself doesn't stop being god the the uh nature of god is immutable Okay. Yeah. So you're saying right. if God yeah. sits down and and had a cup of coffee with you, you would believe that He exists? Is that what you're saying? I, mean, I think it would be possible. Yes. I think it'd be very possible. Oh, I've never had it. You, but it would just be it would just be possible. It wouldn't convince you, but it would be possible. Okay. Well, I mean, it, I'm thinking, is it the difference between knowing it exists, being com- becoming convinced that it exists? Or right. do I need to be convinced that I need to worship it? There's, there's a big distinction there. I, I guess I should have made yeah, that clear. Is. Right. Yeah. Yep. So because there I mean, is, there's you know, distinction. So I guess I, I would I, I say mean, knowing it exists it, and knowing I need to worship it are two different things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Um, I guess I would just say, so how does God creating the universe from nothing? How does that not convince you? But if God uh, was with you and had coffee with, like, why, why the universe? I don't know it did any such thing. I, I don't know it did any such thing as create a universe. Right. I, I have no idea right. that it, it, any God has ever done anything like ah. that. But maybe that would be something we could talk about over dinner or, or just a cup of coffee. Yeah. Well, would you be? What What would it take to convince you? Maybe that it sounds like you're saying if God did create the universe, then you would. You would be you would you would obviously believe that he exists. Is that is that right? I don't know what evidence it could give me. I mean, I'm not making that argument. I can't make God's argument for itself. But you know, if it provided me with something reasonable, and I would think about it. What do you it. mean by reasonable? What about what do you, what do you mean by reasonable? Like uh, with well, with a sound it. philosophical. Okay. Yeah, I would so, say something like that. I mean, just tell me, you know, there was nothing, and I, I decided to, you know, put something together, and all of a sudden, there was something. There was the thing called a universe or a multiverse. But why would he have to? Why would he have to tell you that? Why can't you just use common sense and reason and philosophical thinking and come to the conclusion through good sound arguments that God exists, that He's a necessary being. Why would he have to tell you that? I, I'm not, I guess I'm not understanding that. Well, what I don't understand, I guess, myself is if there is some god or gods out there, if it's necessary if it, or it has a desire for me to know that it exists, why can't it do it itself? Why does it have to have, you know… Your Norm Geisners and you know all these other Billy Grahams or whatever do it. Why are they making the argument? Why can't the God itself? Why can't he write a better book? I suppose a more convincing book that you know well, you, is 
you well, won't stay true to its message, though. regardless of how many translations it goes through. That you know, it's obvious. You know, it's the same book. It, it, it hasn't changed. You know, why can't it just do the, the the hard work? Not that I would think it would be hard work for a God to convince me of something, but why why can't it well, do it instead I of think if God, all these if other God, people? If God, if God showed up to you tonight and told you that He right. was the Creator. And that he loves you, mm-hmm. and he created you. I call you first you thing. I call you first thing. That's what I do. You wouldn't doubt your senses? You wouldn't think that your mind was playing tricks on you? It's possible, but, I mean, I would yeah, of course do possible. whatever I can. What I would, what I would do is, is is try to understand it as best I can, which means I would probably want to prolong the experience so that I can absorb as much information as possible. So that if such a thing ever happened, and I could, uh, you know, understand it well enough, so that when I'm conveying it to someone else, like this, you'd be like the first person I'd call. I'd want you to understand exactly to the minute detail what I experienced. I guess, yeah, but see, then I would say, well, why doesn't God give me that experience, right? And then it just goes on to yeah. everybody. And I guess what I'm I know. saying is, you know, Paul had it. Is, is, you know, Paul got it. I don't understand. Why sure. is Paul so a, special? Well, Paul I wasn't mean, special. I don't, per, was I don't persecute Paul Christians. Was an evil person. I, have, I have never condemned a Christian to death. I've never uh, condemned a Christian to imprisonment or something like that. But that's what Paul was doing. He did that for a while. Mm-hmm. And then one day he's on mm-hmm. the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden he experiences God. Right. Well, and he does that, the Bible tells us, that way God gets the glory and man does not. God takes the worst of the worst, Chris, and that includes me, the worst of the worst, and makes him a trophy for God's grace. That's what he does, and that's why the gospel is amazing. That's what's so amazing about grace. But I guess what well, I'm saying is aren't... you don't need to... Go ahead. I was going to say you don't need the subjective experiences of God. You have a more sound sure way. You have good philosophical reasons and reasoning. We have historical events such as the resurrection and history. Those are not subjective uh, because you're, you're kind of demonstrating that's what everybody would do. Well, how come I didn't get it? How come it? And so you end up with God having to do that to everybody. And then everybody may, you know, you have people doubting their senses. Maybe it's, you know, so I think you have good reason, good philosophical reasoning, you have historical evidence, and you even can look at scientific evidence that all sh- – uh, in a cumulative case that would show God exists and, the, and Christianity is the best explanation for reality. What is your historical That's what evidence I would for the resurrection? Okay. Well, let's get into that. So there's there are uh, – few minimal facts um, that would universally accepted by New Testament scholars, whether uh, atheist, Christian, whatever. These are a few of the facts that are pretty much universally uh, regarded as true. First fact, Jesus died by crucifixion. Uh, second, okay. the disciples right. believed okay, – uh, second, the disciples believed – they saw the risen Jesus. Now that's not that's not saying therefore they did see it. This fact this is a fact that is given that um, they believed that they saw that. So some some of these skeptical scholars that hold this that hold this fact that would say this is a fact would also say well they were hallucinating etc. So I'm not saying that mm-hmm. they did see Jesus. I'm just saying the disciples believed they did. The third fact is James, the skeptical brother of Jesus, ended up believing and dying a martyr. Fourth, Paul, the persecutor, also believed. And then fifth, you have the empty tomb. So those are five minimal facts that are universally accepted um, by your, you know, whether, again, agnostic, atheist, etc., New Testament scholar. So those would be some of the facts I would say, historical facts. Uh, that Jesus it certainly like did. Three. It sounds to me like say that more again. Like three. It sounds to me like he had more like three mm-hmm. instead of five. I mean, you had the crucifixion. Okay. Well, you said there was a, there was an yeah. empty tomb, and in, in the middle you've got you know a group of people who believed 
that they experienced Jesus uh, at risen from well, the dead. It, right. It's important to point out James and Paul separately because they weren't disciples. They weren't friends of Jesus. Paul was not a friend mm-hmm. of Jesus. Uh, he doesn't believe until after Jesus shows up. And so uh, the reason that's important is because you have people that are hostile to Christianity until after the resurrection. Now, when we talked a while back, were you saying that you didn't know if Jesus even existed, or do you grant that Jesus existed? No, no, I, I, I'm not a mythicist. I mean, I think okay. um, it's very likely <laughs> that uh, someone named Jesus lived. Uh, I, I think okay. it's Hebrew Hebrew name would have been Joshua, not Jesus. I think that's his Greek name. Sure. But um, so I what think do you, he, what, what do you do with these particular facts again that are pretty much universally regarded? Um, again, it doesn't prove Jesus rose from the dead. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying as far as inference to the best explanation, um, what do you what would you say happened to the body? I mean, we know he died. Disciples again believed they saw the risen Lord. James, who's a skeptic, ends up believing. Paul, the persecutor, believes. And five, you have an empty tomb. So I guess I would put it on you. Um, how do you? How would you explain it naturally? Well, again, I was going to say that I'm not a mythicist, so I believe there is someone, probably by the name of Jesus, Joshua, whatever, who did live at that time. And but what we know about his life is very limited, in, in the extreme. Uh, I think about. I think most of the stuff that people commonly believe about Jesus is probably a latter creation, including this resurrection part. Um, did he die uh, by crucifixion? Um, probably so. Uh, but I don't think that there was a tomb involved. I, well, that's one of the, the my, minimal it's my understanding. Of well, it's my understanding that, you know, it didn't take much for Roman authorities to, you know, kill someone. Uh, I mean, they did it pretty routinely. Uh, you know, um, they didn't exactly have a system of justice that we're we're familiar with. If if for some reason they felt like they had they were justified in putting Jesus to death, they would have used a crucifixion. That's the way they typically would have done so. If you know, if his crime were, you know, serious enough, and back then, you know, just about any crime was serious enough to warrant, you know, your conviction well, and, and your with execution. Jesus, right, because Jesus is sorry, claiming to be God. Yeah, I was saying, especially with the case of Jesus, I mean, they're worried he's going to, you know, try and do a takeover. Uh, and that's why yeah. not only they, mm-hmm. they put him to death on the cross, but then they also – uh, you know, come up with the story that, well, the disciples stole the body to try and explain the empty tomb. So these are five facts. Again, these are universally uh, accepted. You can look at the works of uh, Gary Habermas, uh, who's done studies oh, in, yeah. in his book, The Historic of Jesus, uh, that shows, mm-hmm. you know, from like the early 60s yeah. or 70s in German, French, and English. These are, these are, these are facts I'm giving you that are not dis- really disputed. I mean, Again, it doesn't mm-hmm. prove Jesus died or uh, rose from the dead, but I'm saying kind of an no. inference to the best explanation. You have to be able to explain these facts in a naturalistic account. And what I was going on about there, about the crucifixion, I, I don't think it has anything to do with the tomb. I don't think his body was ever put in the tomb simply because, like you say, he was creating uh, a disturbance of the peace in that part of the world, of, of the Roman Empire. And you do something like that, you're going to be put down very harshly by the Romans. So I believe they probably very much put him uh, up on on a cross. They crucified him, and I think they certainly intended for him to remain there, not not until he died. But I think they, they intended him to be a symbol to you know all the other people of that era uh, of that area. Well, what, that, do you you mean, know, what, what do you mean not until he died? What do you mean by that? I, I mean, they left his body up there. I believe it was the intention of, of the Romans. You know, we have that he died on the cross. He died on the cross, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think they expected his body to remain on the cross, even though he was dead. I expected 
the uh, Roman authorities to re- his body to remain there. I don't think it was taken down. I think it stayed there, and I I, I don't. I, I apologize if this offends you or anything well, like were, this, but I think it it, it stayed there that. until it you know it decomposed. That's okay. what happened to his so, body. I don't think it was ever put in a tomb. Okay, so let's let's look at that hypothesis that the body rotted on the cross and kind of put it with these particular facts. Um, so it wouldn't really account. I mean, it would account for for the fact number five, maybe the empty tomb. Maybe that would explain why the tomb was empty. Uh, but again, you have a lot of the accounts that Jesus is taken off the cross. He's buried. You even have the hostile witnesses um, saying that, um, you know, tell them that the disciples stole the body. You have guards outside of the tomb. Why would why would the, all that be made up? Like what, what evidence you, could you have for that, that the body well, I mean, was you, not taken you, down? Well, I mean, you could say that about a lot of stories. I and mean, why was it made up? Why was this being made up? I mean, uh, well, so right, much of again, say that, that that's the case. You have to give some reasons as to why. I mean, the, all the accounts okay. have mm-hmm. that he was taken off the cross. The guards are at the tomb. Like that's not even disputed. Hmm. I don't know about that. I, I, again, I'm, I'm. This is my interpretation. You know, uh, can you cite? Can you cite any New Testament scholars? They would say the body was not taken off of the the uh, cross and that it rotted. Do you have any uh, New Testament that, scholars? That years that? years ago, years ago, years ago, I read that fellow Crossan, uh, John Dominic Crossan, I believe. You know, he, yeah. I think he read some, he wrote something about you know the body remained on the cross and unfortunately, you know the the per the purpose again, you know, yeah, he was killed. He was killed by the Roman authorities to send a message to. A group of people. Well, you know, yeah. the, this area, this area of the Roman Empire was volatile. You know as well as I do. It, you know, the Roman Empire. Right. You know, all around the Mediterranean. You know, they, they conquered lots of different people. I think you can say that this area of Palestine, Judea, whatever you want to call it, was uh, very. Mm, well, probably, I guess it was a big problem. They, they had to invest, the Romans had to invest a lot of money to keep it pacified. Because they were always right. kind of revolting. Let me, let me, let me, let me jump that was in why they quick, wanted Chris. to keep his body on the cross. They wanted to keep his body on a cross okay. because it was a symbol for the Romans to send to the Jewish people. You know, you mess with us, this is what's going to happen to you. Yeah, but see, look, at, have look at what little Jesus, look cross. at what little Jesus did, and this is what got him killed. Yeah, well, you wouldn't have to keep him on the cross in order to get that point across, but John Dominic Crossan from the Jesus Seminar, who you cite, he actually uh, says the body was taken off the cross, it was buried in a shallow grave, and the body was eaten by dogs. So he does not say that the body was left up on the cross. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you don't have any any New Testament scholars then that would affirm kind of what you're saying with that then? Again, what I was trying to hint at was the body was left out in the elements. That's what the, the simple explanation I want to give. I <laughs> thought that's what more likely happened. Yeah. The body remained outside in nature, and nature took yeah. its course. I don't want to get any more, you know, uh, detail so, about that. So, do you, do you have any other any other theories you may have? Because again, you have these five facts. You're asking, what are the facts? Jesus died. Well, I don't think do you agree with that. I, I mean, I don't really think that you know. People believing they see something is a fact. I don't know, you know, what so these what people believe, believe they saw because I, I don't know them. So what 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 um what is it that you believe they saw then? Because the disciples I don't know believe, they they believe they saw they the risen Lord. That's the universal fact. Do we know this for and a fact? Though how do we is, know this for a fact? Well, because they're willing to die for what they believe. They willing they're willing to die for what they believe they see, which is the risen Lord. How do so we for know example, that they, if they stole the body? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, who are you talking about that died? Well, uh, Sean McDowell believe, just believing did a whole that, big difference. Well, James, Jesus' brother for one, um, Paul, 
uh, was also, I believe, martyred. Um, it gets, you know, as you get more into church history, um, you know, it may not be a slam dunk on all of them, but there were no, there were some that, that did die, and some were persecuted. Um, you know, very bad uh, for for being Christian. So, I guess the point is they're not going to believe something that they know is a lie. So, well, no, they, no, obviously, no one, no one would. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess you have to kind of explain what is it that they saw then. Were you saying they they're hallucinating or like what do you what do you think that it is that they saw? Well, it's possible. I mean, people have hallucinated uh, uh, seeing someone that they're very very close to uh, within the days or weeks after uh, that person passing away. That's not uncommon. Now, I, I'm not saying that there was a mass hallucination between, you know, you know, multiple people, twelve people, or something like that. But I mean, it is possible that they did have a, a, a hallucination. Someone did. I'm not convinced okay, of it because so, it, it's hard. You know, I mean, if if my neighbor, you know, if if his wife died today and he tells me two weeks from now that you know he he saw her in in their bedroom or something like that. I mean, I'm that's an experience he had. It's not an experience I was ex- I was a part of whatsoever. He he can give me a lot of details and he can talk to me about it for a while, but you know, all I'm going to come away with is, well, you really believe you saw something, but you know I can't confirm it at all. I wasn't there, so I don't know what well, Paul saw. I don't know what James saw. With, yeah, well, with the hallucinations, it's like you're saying it doesn't happen in groups. Right, so you're not mm-hmm. going to have mass you, hallucinations. Second, it wouldn't explain. I mean, you, you, you can have mass hysteria, but I don't know, not mass hallucinations. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, and what you're kind of what you're describing is more of the grief hallucinations. You know, if somebody loses a loved one, for example, happens in nursing homes where the old lady might no, lose no. her husband and and thinks she sees right. him. But the problem with that is again. Um, you have James, who's a skeptic, and you also have Paul, who's a skeptic. Uh, and so they're not going to be having grief hallucinations because they weren't believers. They didn't believe until after they see the risen Lord. So I don't think the hallucination theory works at all. So what's Let next? What else you got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me actually like, go a different route here, a little different thinking here. Why is okay. this important to begin with? Why is this important again? I mean, why as, as a Christian, you're, you're, yeah, you're as a Christian, you're supposed to be, you know, accept as fact that Jesus died for your sin and and, and came back. Uh, he, right. he was resurrected. He defeated death. Whatever. Why is that important exactly? Great question, Chris. So. We would say that um, it's important because our sin has to be atoned for. So, again, this is going to get into Christian theology and assumes kind of a Christian framework. But you have at the, at the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, um, Adam's, uh, Eve sins, but it's, it's actually leads Adam into sin. Adam is held accountable. From there, uh, man is cut off and separated from God. And so Christ is like the second Adam who comes, fulfills the works of the law, uh, does what Adam couldn't do, dies in our place because we've all sinned against God. uh, And so basically that deserves uh, eternal separation from God. And, you know, you can get into different views of what you think hell is, et cetera. But it's it's you know, it's say it's it's separation from, from God. And so Christ dying on the cross and coming back from the dead is demonstrating he is who he claimed to be. He is God. He has defeated death. He owns death. He's the one that gives life. He's the one that takes away. And that it's through his sacrifice on the cross uh, is exactly what that gives uh, believers redemption and justification. Why couldn't he just forgive everyone? I mean, why is it necessary for this God to recreate himself as another person and then have that person. What do you mean by recreate re- himself? Pardon me? What, what do you mean by recreate himself? What do you mean by recreate himself? 
Well, uh, 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 according to the New Testament, God uh, impregnated Mary right. and gave birth to himself. I mean, Jesus and God are the same yeah, thing. So that's, well, so, so are you well, familiar what with happened, well, excuse me, wait a minute, Hold on just a second. He, yeah. After doing that, I mean, he allows what he calls his son, even though they're part of the same thing, the Godhead, whatever. He allows that person to be brutally murdered. I mean, you know, we have, we can both agree crucifixion is horrible. That's a horrible sure. way to die. And somehow yeah. that person's you know blood being shed absolves all of humanity of all its sins. I mean, it seems like a, a roundabout way of going around to uh, forgive people. I don't. I, I mean, it just seems very convoluted. I mean, if you wrong me, Devin, I mean, you know, I have a couple of options. I can get revenge, maybe, or I can just forget about it, or I can just, you know, I forgive you. You know, you stole my car, but I forgive mm-hmm. you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, that's the way we do things. That's the way you do things. The way I do things. I don't know why sure. God couldn't have just done it that way it's, it's itself. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to go through. So this let me ask you a question. Ritual. Yeah, let me ask you. Let me ask. Let me ask you a question, uh, Chris. Would you want to go to church Sunday and spend time with uh, Christians and hearing a preacher, you know, talk about God and preaching out of the Bible and that? Would you want to spend your Sunday doing that? I'm not, not really. I mean, I know you're. <laughs> yeah, not really. That's, and that's. I'm not offended by that. That's fine. Would you want to be forced to go to church on Sunday and have to sit there and be around Christians and listen to worship music and listening to the pastor preach out of the Bible? Would you want to be forced to do that? No, I wouldn't want to be forced either. Mm-mm. Okay. So not, you wouldn't want to. Not too many things I want to be forced to do. Me neither. I'm with you. (laughs) So you wouldn't want to do it voluntarily. You would not want to do it voluntarily, and you would not want to do it by force. So you want the option, if you don't want to go, you want to have that option to not not go. Is that right? Yeah, it would be nice to have the freedom. Freedom is a good thing. So in the same way, Christ is not going to force you Because when we talk about believing in Jesus and having your sins forgiven, what it's saying is you're reconciled to God and that now you're able to spend eternity with him. You don't want to go to church and spend an hour with the people of God and hear the word of God, and you certainly don't want to be forced to do that. So if God is giving you the option and you don't want to believe and you don't want to – when I say don't want to believe, say you use the same thing as a synonym, synonym is you don't want to be reconciled to God. Well, then how can you blame or, or try and say it's unfair that he doesn't force you to do those things? He's giving you what you will. You don't want to be around the people of God. You don't want to hear the word of God. You don't want to be reconciled to God. So he's not forcing you to do that. So why complain well, that you're but in not the end, forced to do that? Yeah, but in the end, he gets it gets to decide uh, whether I end up in hell or not. You well, know, that doesn't seem like a fair choice. Right. Well, you well, accept no, him as a creator. Yourself, I don't accept don't... him as a creator. I I well, accept you, it as a, yeah, a moral you're... monster. Right. So if that's what you accept it as then how can you say he is the one that is forcing you to go to hell? You don't want to be with him. You don't want to be reconciled to him. You don't want to worship him, and you don't want to be forced to do those things. So what are you complaining and what about? It, and then it, it, but then that doesn't mean I want to be tortured for eternity. Well, that gets into <laughs> I, what hell is, right? So I would not say yeah. hell is torture. That's a, that's a caricature. What you want, Chris, is what a lot of atheists want. They want the good things that life has. They just don't want the creator and the goods that come with it. But sorry, if you reject the creator, you don't get the goods that come with the creation. Well, most people think of hell as being a horrible place to be in. And oh, it uh, will be. Atheists like my. 
it's not like the caricatures. It's not like Saddam Hussein's torture chamber. Dr. Geisler, uh, in his systematic theology, has a great section on this. We would say hell. I would say hell. Is, I kind of hold like a C.S. Lewis view. It's torment. It's not torture. It's not being inflicted from the outside. It's you knowing you could have been with the most beautiful being in the universe, and you willingly blew it. You willingly did well, not want to be with him. And so he's giving you – Well, if, I, out. if that's not the case – Check this out. Check this out. I, not what you want. Hold on, hold on. Not what you want he's going to give you, but he's going to give you what you will. So just like the drug addict who doesn't want to wake up and have those horrible effects of the drug, they willed it the night before. And the person that goes to hell, it's not that they even want to be there, but they have willed to be there. And so God gives them what they have willed. And so it's knowing you could have been with the most beautiful being in the universe, and you willingly rejected it. You don't want to be forced. You don't want to be forced into it. So God gives you what that's you your, will. Yeah, and that, that's, that's in your interpretation, the most beautiful thing in the universe. I mean I look at it as you know, a, a moral monster that is responsible because you don't for, for the understand death Christian of Christian theology. Yeah. You don't, you well, don't I understand mean, Christian theology. You don't understand Christian theology. Well, I do, theology. I, I I do understand the fact that – I say that, that with love. Okay. But I mean – I say that I, with I'm love, re- but you've never, you've, never, you've, you've never read a systematic theology. You've never read any philosophy of religion. You get the caricatures – from people like Christopher Hitchens and Bill Maher mm-hmm. and these guys mm-hmm. that are low-hanging fruit that would get absolutely mm-hmm. demolished against a Christian philosopher who knows theology and knows philosophy. So if I you want to know who God is. No, no, no. I've never seen Christopher Hitchens ever be demolished by any Christian theologian or philosopher. You, know, you could watch his, never debate seen with, that. watch his debate with Frank Turek, watch his debate with William Lane Craig. I, I, have. Would, I would appeal to the people. Logic. Okay, so the argument Turret gives for the origin of the universe, Hitchin doesn't respond just like you didn't tonight. I give you the arguments. I give you the reason. No response. It ends up in complaint and mockery. That's not arguments, my friend. Again, you were saying a moment ago, it's the most beautiful creature or whatever in the universe. And the first thing that came to my mind, this is the same thing. Being that you know caused this massive flood that you know engulfed the entire planet and wiped out humanity, save one family, and you're telling me that that's not a moral monster and that it's deserving of my worship. And but if Chris, I don't get it, then I get it. I get to be tormented for eternity. How about I just be left alone for eternity? How about that? Because that, not my that. friend, that's what you – no, that's what you want. I get it. That's what you want. You want to be left alone, but that's not what you're designed for. And if you don't, if you don't want to be with God, he's going to give you exactly what you just asked for, to be left alone. And you get that, mm. but you don't get the goods of God. You don't get to be left alone and have the goodness and beauty of the creator. You don't get that. Well, I don't, right? I don't you want to be sure left don't. in eternity with Sodom Hussein, much less. You know, a god that would wipe out an entire planet worth of people, except for one small family. I mean, that's genocide. That, I don't want to be associated with people for like that for eternity. Yeah, but the the thing is, a couple things. First, you know, you you yourself have rejected the Creator, so you're not an innocent party. You have sinned against God, and you've sinned against your fellow man because we all have. So it's not oh. like you know you're down there with all the evil people. We're all evil, and that's why we need the gospel. Uh, but second of all, as an atheist, you have no standard by which you're saying God is being just or unjust. Naturalism doesn't afford that furniture in the house for you to be able to say God is being unjust here. You don't have any ground to say that. Why is it wrong to kill people? Why is genocide wrong in a naturalistic worldview? Because people want to live. People don't want their their most precious right, their life, nope. taken from them. You know, arbitrarily. Where do they get that right, though? In an, in naturalistic worldview, my friend, where do you get the right to life? 
How do you think you get it from a god that would take it away from you for no reason, basically, whatsoever? He doesn't take it away. How There's an objective moral value. There's an objective standard, and that is only being able to be grounded in a in a transcendent mind who is eternal what did all and those a necessary being. What did all that those people again? do to deserve? To be, what did all those people do to deserve to be drowned? What on earth did all those old men and women, all those babies, all those unborn babies do to be mm-hmm. drowned in this? You know this great flood. What what happened there? Well, I mean, for somebody that is pro-choice and has no problem with abortion, I'm surprised you would complain about um, you know God killing babies. But <laughs> okay, I mean, it seems, uh, I mean it, on your part, but, you, um, the Bible I mean, I is could, drenched in innocent you. blood. The Bible is just drenched in innocent blood of babies. That's for sure. Well. The Bible says there's no, there isn't anybody innocent, and that's, again, why Christ comes. But, again, it goes back to the same point I made earlier, Chris. People had a chance to repent, to be reconciled to God. They wanted it just like you. Leave me alone. And so he does. And with that comes judgment. Do you want to be left alone? God will leave you alone. But you don't get who is the this good God to judge created. me. Who, but who is this God to judge me? I don't go so around give killing you one person. I don't go around killing people, and I don't go around killing a whole race of people. No. I mean, how can it judge me? So are you, are you sinless? Are you, you're not saying you're sinless, certainly. Oh, I'm not perfect. You lied. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, that's who he well. is to judge you. He, he is perfect. No. Right? He is perfect, and so he's the creator He's the judge. And the thing is, you know, he's not going to – he doesn't want to judge you by how you've lived your life, Chris. That's why he's offering you Christ. You know, but if you don't want him, then you're going to be judged yeah, but by I how mean, you've lived your life. <laughs> look at what he did. I mean he had to recreate himself as an in, another individual and kill that individual through torture for me. Huh. I mean no thank you. So You don't need to do that. Yeah, so – so part of it is with Christian theology is he doesn't recreate himself. That's kind of that Bill Maher talking point. Um, it's, it's he adds to himself a human nature. So the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're not the same person. See, I, I get what you're saying, and I get why you find it silly and incomprehensible. I get it because you have not had good exposure. Part of it is that. Part of it is you're, you are rebellious towards Christ. I'm going to be honest. But the other part I is admit it. You, haven't had, you haven't had good exposure to good theology. But now you have. And so I'm saying you need to understand what the doctrine of the Trinity is, what salvation is. You need to understand those things and what Christians teach about them before you reject them because – you're just rejecting a caricature that Christians don't even believe. You're rejecting the God that I don't believe in, Chris. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I plan to continue my studies. Don't you worry. I will plan to continue because I find I it all it. fascinating. I really do. I, I really it, do. Man. I do find it very, very interesting. I do too. And, you know, like I say, uh, we both get animated, but – I love you, man. I love you, and I hope you don't take anything I say, you know, as offense. I, I, you know, I say those things because I do love you. Because I do, I, I, I don't want you to go to hell. I do want you to be in heaven, and I want you to lead your family uh, to Christ. You know, but I want to do it, you know, in a way that's going to compel you through good, good reasons and arguments. And I know, you know, I know God has to has to do that. So. You know, just don't take anything I say, hopefully, you know, as offensive or anything like that. I I think the yes, world is I have enjoyed the entire conversation. We've had a good time. I have enjoyed it. We'll have to have you back and figure out something to do on part three. Yeah, we'll have to talk about something else. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Are you going to come do down to the uh, – you going to come down to the apologetics conference in October at uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary? I haven't heard much about it. I'm not certain of what it costs. Okay. Uh, I uh, I'm not certain the about the. It's it certainly going to depend I'll on the top. Yeah. Well, there's a bunch. So this is like 3,000 Christians that come, and it's all kind of like 30, 40 talks. 
the top Christian apologist in the world. If you want to go, man, I will get. I'll make sure I get you a ticket, and you're more than welcome to stay mm-hmm. with me that night. You know, so you have a place to stay. You have a ticket. I'd love to have you come, man. I think I, even if you don't agree, we've had other atheists come in the past. You know, they don't. They're not Christians now, but you know, they they enjoyed coming. And so, you know, if you want to come, I'll make sure you have a ticket and you got a place to stay with me. Thank so you. That's I'll very send you more information. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd like to see that. Great. I will send you a link on that, send you the information, and uh, we'll get it going. So thanks for coming on, brother. I'll All send right. you the link Until to the show. Until next time, you and, take care. Uh, I hope to hear from you soon. You will. You will, Chris. Thanks again, my friend. God bless. All right. Have a great, great weekend. Mm-hmm. Bye. You too. All right, friends. Uh, good conversation, um, spirited conversation, but I'm not going to hold back. You know, um, I love Chris, and, uh, you know, uh, I've never met his, his wife and kid, but I love them too, and I want to see them, you know, I want to see them come to Christ as well. Uh, and so I think we need to give good reasons and good arguments. And, uh, you know, I hope, uh, you know, I hope he walks away thinking about this. So keep him in your prayers. We plan to have him hopefully back on again and uh, have another topic to talk about. But, uh, again, join us Wednesday, this coming, actually this Wednesday, it's not this Wednesday, it's the following one that we'll be having Dave on. But we will have a show this Wednesday, and uh, I think we're, we're supposed to uh, talk about some, uh, maybe some stuff on abortion and have Melissa talk a little bit about her time uh, in Greensboro uh, and my time in Greensboro on the panel, as well as uh, at the Youth Apologetics Conference. It's been a blast. Friends, um, you know, we do what we do because, uh, you know, we're missionaries. We are uh, supported by those who see what we do, the mission that we do, and, you know, they believe in what we're doing. Uh, And so if you would be ever so kind if you would want to join us in what we're doing. Uh, you can go to www.devinplude.ratiochristi.org. Pull that up real quick, make sure it's working. And you can kind of see our, our site and uh, what it is exactly that we, you know, that we're doing. And uh, feel free to message us on Facebook in that. And uh, let us know you are listening to the show, that you like the show. We would appreciate it. So thank you guys again. Until next time, God bless.